The Oldest Student: How Mary Walker Learned to Read, written by Rita Lorraine Hubbard, illustrated by Ogi Mora, and read by Mr. Alicea. Whenever young Mary Walker was tired, she would shield her eyes from the sun, and watch the swallow-tailed kites dip and soar above the trees. That must be what it's like to be free, she thought. But Mary didn't watch for long. Even at only eight years old, she knew the first rule of the Union Springs, Alabama plantation she lived on: keep working. She knew the second rule too: slaves should not be taught to read or write or do anything that might help them learn to do so. Mary didn't stop working. She didn't learn to read either. But at the end of each long day, picking cotton. Toting water to Papa and the other slaves who chopped wood for the train tracks, or helping Mama clean the big house, she would lie in her little bed next to the crumbling fireplace and think about those birds. When I'm free, I'll go where I want and rest when I want, and I'll learn to read too. When she was fifteen, it happened. Mary and her mother, brothers and sister were free. The Emancipation Proclamation said so. What it didn't say was how a family with nothing except the tattered garments on their backs could find food, clothes, and a place to sleep. Mary's mother had died, and the family was on its own. Freedom Road to Freedom Road, across fields and through woods, ex-slaves surged like waves crashing hard to shore. Now that they were free, every road was Freedom Road. Many headed north and west and every which way, searching for long-lost family members or simply experiencing the wonder of being free. Others, like Mary, chose to stay in the South. An organization called the Freedom's Bureau helped those who stayed to find shelter on abandoned Confederate land. Mary and her family settled in a one-room cabin. And for the next few years, she worked alongside her mama to help feed her siblings. Seven days a week, she churned butter, cleaned houses, and cared for other folks' children. The hours were long, and if Mary was thirsty or hungry or needed to use the outhouse, she had to wait until she got home. At week's end, she would offer mama the only quarter she had earned. One day. Mary met a group of evangelists on the roadside. A woman with soft wrinkles in her kindly face placed a big, beautiful Bible in Mary's hands and told her, "Your civil rights are in these pages." Mary didn't know what civil rights were. She only knew that top to bottom, front to back, that book was filled with words. I'm going to learn to read those words," she vowed. "But not today. Today there was work to be done, and tomorrow too. When Mary got married, she and her husband worked as sharecroppers, renting someone else's house, using someone else's tools, and planting someone else's seeds to farm land they would never own. After they harvested the crops, almost all the money they earned went to pay for the housing, tool. And seed costs. Mary was twenty years old when her first son was born. She opened her Bible and marveled at the squiggles inside. There had been no time to learn to read. A friend wrote Mary's son's birth date in the Bible, August twenty-sixth, eighteen sixty-nine. Then Mary dipped a pen into an inkwell and made her mark beside it. Not a letter, not a name. Just a mark. It was the best she could do. One day, Mary's husband died. She married again, and a second son was born. Then a third. Mary made marks for these sons too. Now she had three growing boys. More money. That's what we need. Mary thought. But the only other jobs available to black women were as maids, or nannies, or cooks. The hours were long. With only half a day off on Saturdays, and like sharecropping, they didn't pay much. Mary sighed. Words would have to wait. Words 
would have to wait. For the next four decades, Mary sharecropped and did odd jobs to help support her family. In 1917, Mary's family moved to the little city of Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was the year of Chattanooga's great flood. The story was in all the newspapers, but Mary could only study the pictures to understand what had happened. By now, Mary was 68 and too old to share crop, but she continued to work, cooking, cleaning, and babysitting. She also fried fish, baked cakes, and sold sandwiches to raise money for her church. On Sundays, she would sit in the congregation, and as the preacher spoke, she would clutch her family Bible, the Bible she still couldn't read. When Mary was well past 90, she and her husband sat in their creaky rockers while one or another of their sons read to them. After the two younger boys died, the eldest read. Then Mary's husband died. Several years later, her eldest son died, too. He was 94. Mary had outlived her entire family. She was 114 years old and alone. Can't read, she said. Can't write. I don't know anything. Mary stood at the window of her retirement home and gazed down at the world below. Words were everywhere, on billboards, on buildings, on store windows and trucks. She sighed. All this time, she thought, and they still look like squiggles. Mary had heard about a new reading class held in her building. She pursed her lips. No more waiting, she decided. Time to learn. Out of her apartment, into an elevator, and down to the lobby she went. When the elevator doors sprang open, Mary saw people sitting under a sign with the picture of an open book. She could not read the words. A neighbor walked up to her. That's a reading class, Miss Mary. Can I help you over? Mary shook her head. Then she gripped her cane, lifted her chin, and walked straight toward the sign. For the next year and more, Mary put everything she had into learning to read. It wasn't easy, after all. She was the oldest student in the class, and probably in the entire country. Could someone her age learn to read? She didn't know, but by God, she was going to try. She studied the alphabet until her eyes watered. She memorized the sounds each letter made and practiced writing her name so many times that her finger cramped. She learned to recognize sight words and then challenged herself to make short sentences with them. She studied and studied, until books and pages and letters and words swirled in her head while she slept. One fine day, Mary's hard work paid off. She could read. Word of her accomplishments traveled, and people everywhere celebrated with her. Chattanooga's mayor, Newspaper journalists across the country and a man from the U.S. Department of Education who said, Mrs. Mary Walker, I pronounce you the nation's oldest student. All shared her joy. Mary felt complete. She still missed her sons, but whenever she was lonely, she read from her Bible or looked out her window and read the words in the street below. From then on, Chattanoogans honored Mary's achievement with yearly birthday parties. In 1966, President Lyndon B. Johnson sent well wishes on Mary's 118th birthday, and in 1969, President Richard Nixon did the same. Mary was now 121 years old. Mary received many gifts over the years. A radio, a sofa, her very first television, a new Bible, the key to the city, and perfume, and champagne from the Canadian Mounties. She also received something that brought back those long days in the Alabama cotton fields, her first airplane ride. From the cockpit window, Mary gazed at the trees and rooftops below. No different than a horse and buggy ride, she joked, but she knew it was. As the airplane dipped and soared like those swallow-tailed kites of long ago, 
Mary decided that flying was a lot like reading. They both made a body feel as free as a bird. Each year before her birthday celebration came to an end, someone would whisper, let's listen to Miss Mary. The shuffling and movement would fade away until not a sound was heard. Then Mary would stand on her old, old legs, clear her old, old throat, and read from her Bible or her school book in a voice that was clear and strong. When she finished, she would gently close her book and say, You're never too old to learn.